Hi everyone. Today we're going to talk about extending Envoy proxy with WebAssembly. My name is Edith Levine and I'm the founder and CEO of Solo.io. And I have here Yuval Kohavi, the chief architect of Solo.io. And we will share with you about WebAssembly and Envoy. So let's start uh, giving a bit of an intro a little bit about the control plane and data plane separation, just as it's important to understand the moving parts here. So if we we'll go to the next slide, we will see that the way Envoy is structured is that Envoy itself is configured through a different component called a control plane that's responsible of processing user configuration and updating Envoy in real time, dynamically, in an eventual consistent way of that configuration. And in this slide, you can see that we have two examples, one of Itzio and one of Glue. Both of these use Envoy as the data plane component, right? The data plane is where a user data a HTTP requests flow through, and they are the control plane component for Envoy. And the control plane is the channel where configuration messages uh, go through. And if we'll uh, move on to the next slide, we can see sort of this visualization where a user configuration in Glue's case, Glue processes Kubernetes CRDs. And one of the CRDs is a virtual service goes into Glue. And then uh, uh, if Glue processes it through a glue list of plugins that understand the user configuration. It gets translated to Envoy configuration and delivered onto Envoy. And now the reason for this uh, extra API, because the user configuration that glue provide is use case specific and simpler to understand than the Envoy configuration. Glue also can automate a lot of the parts that Envoy needs, for example, cluster membership and endpoints and making Envoy easier to operate. Now, if we'll continue, we can talk about how the data path looks like, and we can see that an HTTP request comes into Envoy, and that's one of the key parts that make Envoy very useful as a cloud native proxy, the ability to extend it, right? The request doesn't just pass through a Envoy onto the upstream, it actually goes through a series of filters that can modify the request and impact, glue be impact the behavior of the proxy. So in this example, we can see that the request goes through, through Envoy's filter chain, first hitting the external auth filter where it's con consulted with an external auth server whether or not to authorize the request. Moving on to the rate limit filter where it consults a rate limiting server, whether or not to allow the request for rate limiting purposes. And finally, it traverses to a gRPC transcoder filter that allows you to provide a REST interface externally, but convert it to a gRPC interface internally. So your microservices can talk gRPC, which is very common in the uh, Go microservices ecosystem, while your uh, front end, your uh, external facing API will be a REST API that's easier to consume from JavaScript. So that's kind of how Envoy looks like. And one of the uh, nice things about Envoy is that it's extendable. So if you'll go on the next slide, we can see that we can also insert custom extension points, custom filters onto Envoy. And the rest of the talk, we're going to talk a little bit more about these custom filters and how Wasm fits in. Now, uh, when talking about extending a product, usually we have a checklist of things we want to, to get out of it, right? So we want to be able a language, to use a language of our choice. We want this extension to work fast. We want it to be safe that if we have an issue in the extension, it doesn't bring down the whole proxy where a lot of other traffic, potentially multi-tenant traffic flows through. Uh, we don't wanna now, we only wanna build our code. We probably don't want to rebuild all of Envoy uh, just to extend it. And we want an easy to use experience. And with that in mind, let's, uh, I'll hand it over to Edith to talk a little bit more about that. Thanks, Yuval. So basically, 
basically we'll take an example of the two uh, control plan that basically extending Envoy um, and managing Envoy and basically see how they decided to go about extending the data plane. So the first thing that we will look at is Glue. And Glue is an API gateway based on Envoy. Uh, it's focusing majorly on the edge. That's the, the use case. And when we looked at how we can actually extend Envoy, we decided that because we more care about a, the performance, right? We want to make sure this is a, basically on the control path, on the request path. So we, latency is extremely important. We decided that we want to make sure that those filters are going to live still in the proxy and not going to do any round trip. But that means that it's hard because the way to actually extend those uh, filter is, uh, is by writing a C++ async um, a, a filter code and then recompile Envoy. So by us choosing to decided to take this vendor on us, in that case, the solo company, solo AI company, basically we make it extremely, uh, you know, it's extremely, to the user itself, we make sure that it's extremely fast, right? Because it's in the control pad and it's built into the binary basically of Envoy. Uh, it's extremely safe because, you know, there is no round trip, right? There's no network involved or wire involved in this. But of course, it's not the easiest thing to do, right? As I said, C++ code is not something easy to do. We, will, we are basically recompiling Envoy for, for the users. So there's nothing easy about that, right? We, we chose this. We're taking the law for us. So it's, you know, it is easy for our customers. But in the natural for us, it, it, you know, it's a challenging thing. And you know, and there's not a lot of people who can do that. Um, STO took a different approach. And when STO started, basically their idea was, we really care about extensibility. We really want people to be able to take that and write it by themselves and not be depending on us. And in order to do this, they basically came with Mixer. And the idea with Mixer is basically that every time that the request is coming to, uh, to the proxy, it's going to basically take the request and route it to Mixer. And Mixer basically will get all the requests and will be able to do whatever we want from it. Telemetry, or maybe you wanted to do some, uh, you know, any adapter that people might want and basically return the request to, to the proxy after it. The problem with that is, you know, there is a lot of advantage with this, right? Potentially right now people, right? Be able to use their own language because Mixer can communicate gRPC, you know, honest to God, most of the people were using Go. Um, it's not fast, right? I mean, that's the majority problem that they, if people are talking about or talked about stability in STL, that was the majority of the problem because there is a full request for, for constantly going on the wire. Um, it is safe, right? I mean, it is going over the wire. You know, again, there is communication between two components here. It's not in the same binary, so potentially there's always a problem, but, you know, relatively it's safe. You definitely don't need to compile Envoy, which is a very, very uh, huge advantage. And it, it, it easy, you know, I don't know, it, it's still a complex problem to solve, but it's easier than write a C++ async and recompile. So, you know, when you're looking at this, um, you know, the Google guys uh, and the Envoy community understood that this approach that the STO community took is a little bit problematic. There was a lot of problem with that and try to figure out what different way we can go. So as an Envoy community, we decided to basically to explore the WebAssembly. So that's kind of like overview a little bit of what is WebAssembly and why we thought we thought that this would be a good way to, to leverage that technology. So first of all, WebAssembly, funny enough, it's not an assembly code, right? It's a binary structure format. And it's not only for the web, as you know, because we're bringing it to, uh, to Envoy. Uh, so it's a little bit misled, but the idea with actually creating WebAssembly, the, 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 the major reason for its existence is to extending the browser, right? That's why people uh, did it. And the idea was that they wanted an ability to be able to extend the browser with, but you know, with that, they needed to have some use case to make sure that for instance, it's portable, right? Because the browser can run everywhere. So we need to make sure that it doesn't matter which operating system you're using. They need to make sure that it's secure because the last thing that they want is that they because some WASM extension that is not, you know, a, you know that, that some error prone or something like that, it will take all the browser down. That's something that we definitely don't want to make sure that they want. So they created a sandbox. Um, 
We want to make sure that it's fast because again, performance is extremely important in the browser as well as the as the Envoy. And you can actually see here that it's very interesting is that if before if you know before the was and people were using uh, JavaScript, JavaScript is not going to be extremely fast. And the reason is because there's just more things that should be you know a process while actually it's running. With WebAssembly, it's basically much more a slim version of what should be happening when the thing is running. So you only need to, uh, you don't need to parse, you don't need to do a lot of stuff. It's already basically packaged very minimum. Uh, the last, you know, the other thing, as you well mentioned before, you probably prefer that the customer will be able, you know, your user will be able to use any language. And for that, in Web, in WebAssembly, they created a very interesting, you know, nice, um, an interface uh, that basically means that you can choose the language of your choice, and there is some um, representative, uh, intermediate, intermediate representative that can go to whatever process, like eight, uh, you know, eighty six or ARM. Um, and the last one that ex that was extremely interesting when they um, when they when they came with is the ability to actually run it outside the the, the browser itself. And by creating this uh, interface, WASI, that's what basically allowing us to eventually bring it to Envoy. So all those functionality of fast, secure, portable, and as well as, uh, as any language, it's what basically make that attractive technology extremely, extremely attractive for something like Envoy. And this is what we decided to bring it. Because if you think about it, if we leverage it, then we can use any function, any language. It will be very fast because it's very close to um, assembly code. It will be safe because it will be on the same binary. There is no need to compile because it's basically extended Envoy without needed to actually compile it. And it will be ex relatively extremely easy or easier than, than do the rest. So I will end out to you Val to explain you how exactly we took WebAssembly and brought it to the Envoy together with the community. Thank you, Deet. So let's talk about that. Uh, as mentioned before, the Envoy has a series of filters that can act on the request and change it. And essentially the way Wasm is integrated onto Envoy is as a custom filter, right? So as far as Envoy is concerned, most of Envoy core is not aware of Wasm at all, but rather Wasm is implemented as a native Envoy filter, as we can see in the next slide, that filter actually talks with the Envoy runtime and runs WASM code. So most of core Envoy is not really aware that it's running WASM. And that also has the advantage of those filters having almost the full power of a native Envoy filter. And that is accomplished using something we call the ABI. So the way the workflow works is that a Wasm VM is built into Envoy. So we have V8, uh, we have Wavm, and we have a now VM that's not really Wasm, but more for uh, development purposes and testing purposes. Uh, when you want to use a Wasm filter in Envoy, you create a, an Envoy filter, or you instantiate in the Envoy config an Envoy filter of type Wasm and tell the Wasm filter to load your Wasm code with a, a specific uh, Wasm VM. The Wasm Envoy native filter communicates with your Wasm code using this interface called the ABI. And in the next slide, we see sort of an illustration of what this ABI looks like. It's all open source on GitHub, so you can uh, check it out yourself. Essentially, it's a definition of C-like functions that uh, pretty much correspond to the Envoy internal interfaces today and allow you to do the same request modifications that filters can do today. So again, things like we saw before, like external auth, like transformation, all of this a Wasm filter can do. It has the advantages that the you can load it dynamically into Envoy. You don't need to recompile Envoy. You don't even need to restart Envoy, right? It's all loaded dynamically as 
as regular filters can be loaded dynamically. And um, it has the advantage of you being able to externally write and develop it. Uh, if we go in the next slide, we can see that today there are various languages already supported. So you, in order to essentially write a filter, you can write it using the raw SDK, but it'd be much easier to use a language specific SDK that brings the native language concepts to your development flow. So today we have SDKs for C++, Assembly Script, and Rust. Uh, there's an additional tiny go. And we have a list of them all in our uh, WASMI repo, and we'll refer to that later. And using the SDK allows you a much easier development experience than the raw ABI, because they abstract much of the low level details of WASM, of you know, memory management, sandboxing, all that stuff. So if we'll move on to the next slide, we can summarize that uh, the way it works today is that you use a language specific SDK to build your WASM filter. And then the WASM filter that you wrote communicates with the Envoy WASM native filter using the ABI in a WASM VM of your choice where currently V8 and WAVM are supported. And with that, we can summarize and we can see that we achieved almost all our uh, requirements from before. And the one thing, the one point of friction is how to get the WASM module from your developer laptop into the cluster. And uh, I'll let you talk a little bit more about how this developer experience is solved using a, a tool we created. Thanks, Yuval. So basically when we looked at this, and we understand the amazing power that it's giving right now to the user. I also saw this tweet, and that tweet is from Solomon Haik, the founder of uh, Docker. And basically, Link Cloud is one of the, 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 the leader of WebAssembly ecosystem, basically announcing WASI. Solomon Haik mentioned that if WASI and WASM was existing in 2008, we will never create a Docker, right? And that's basically gave me kind of like the connotation of the fact that, as you well mentioned before, it will be extremely hard. Like it's really nice technology, but it's extremely hard to go about doing it. And when you think about it, this is what happened with the container ecosystem. Because back then, you know, Google did an amazing job, Google and the ecosystem, to basically create the Linux container. But to make the Linux container as popular, right, that everybody can use it, including us, we need a Docker to make it very simple to use. So when I saw that, I realized that this is something that we can help with. And, it, and there is a lot of, of, of uh, similarity between what happened with Docker and what happened right now with WebAssembly. And that's why we decided to create WebAssembly Hub. So what is WebAssembly Hub? So it's very familiar. It's basically giving you the Docker-like experience for WebAssembly bringing to Android platform. So in the natural is, is very, very simple uh, interfaces. It's a command line and it's a registry. And I will let actually you will show you that instead of me actually uh, talk about it. But by actually bringing this experience as well to the user, we kind of like checked everything, everything that we wanted on the list, right? It's use any language, it's fast, it's safe. There's no need to compile. And now with WebAssembly app, it's also extremely simple. And now I will hand it to you, Val, to show us a quick demo. Thank you, Edith. Uh, let me share my screen and I will do a quick demonstration of WASMI, our uh, tool for developer experience. All right. I hope everybody can see my IDE. Let me make it a bit bigger. Let's start with the demo. So th in this demo, we're gonna show how we can use WASMI to create a nice developer workflow of creating, building, and distributing and running our WebAssembly Envoy filters. So the first thing we'll start with is with WASMI in it. And WASMI in it essentially has a template of a filter so we can uh, you know, have something to start with, right? Uh, kind of like a, the React app template. Uh, when we run this command, we choose the language we would like to use. We'll use assembly script and we choose uh, the platform we want to support. 
the Wasm ABI has multiple ABI versions. So this step uh, explains to us which version of the glue and itio this filter will support. Uh, once it's done, you can see that it has extracted uh, our Wasm template and we can open a bit of code right now inside of the new filter folder, uh, the index.ts in the assembly folder. And you can see this is a assembly script file. It's very similar in the syntax to TypeScript. And now just for uh, fun, we'll change this a little bit. So what this filter does, it's a very simple filter and on response headers, right? Whenever a response comes into Envoy, it appends additional header onto the response. And now I can just change this from hello world to hello asm, uh, wasm, and save. Now, do note that this, uh, what we'll see is how we build and inject this filter onto Envoy. So the next step would be to build the filter. And we do that using wasmi build. Wasmi build takes an argument what builder type to use, in our case, assembly script, and the image tag to use. And this is a very similar concept to Docker images. And in our case, the image tag is WebAssembly Hub.io slash Yuval, which is my username on WebAssembly Hub.io, and then the uh, image name, add header, and a version. And finally, dot to build the local directory. So this now pulls in a build container with all the build tools you need. So you don't need to have npm pre-install and builds the filter for us. And let's give it a second to finish. All right, it, as you can see, it created a filter with our image tag and that filter has our wasm already in it. And we can see if we'll do wasmi list, you can see that we have this image listed as an image that was just built. Now, in order to distribute this, we can do wasmi push. Now, this is very, very similar to how Docker push work. And in fact, we even use the same code. And wasmi push will push this to WebAssembly Hub. And speaking of WebAssembly Hub, let's take a look at that. So we have here the WebAssembly Hub open. And this is our uh, portal to essentially help you discover, deploy, and pull, and publish all your extensions. And as you can see, let's explore this a little bit. Let's view more repositories. You can see that there's a lot of existing filters already from uh, uh, users in the community. Just sign up. It's free to sign up and uh, push your code. Uh, we can filter by label to kind of help you narrow down by use case. If we look, for example, at the security label, we can see uh, this filter that has a nice description to it. And then it also gives you the command you need to pull it. So you can do wasmi pull to pull this filter from a uh, WebAssembly hub locally into your uh, local uh, laptop. Now uh, let's uh, log in just to show you how my user looks like. And you can see that I'm also a member of the Solo I organization and these are filters published to the Solo org. But if I go to my own user, you can see the add header filter that we just pushed. All right, let's continue with the demo. So once the filter is all built and all pushed, we can deploy it. So once we deploy here, I'll just deploy locally to Envoy to have it just run fast. And let's run this command, deploy. We currently support a glue and itio uh, or local Envoy. What it'll do is essentially pull in the image if needed and then uh, run it and essentially give you a very quick and easy way to get your filter loaded and running. And now let's see that everything is working. If everything is working, I expect to see this hello wasm header on the response. So let's do a head request just so I can get some headers. And you can see here, the request was sent successfully and the response indeed contains the hello uh, wasm response header that I just created in this filter. 
And uh, that's it. That is our demo for WASMI, the tools that allow you to uh, build, publish, and deploy your WebAssembly Envoy Fiddlers. Uh, take it away, Did for some final words. Thanks so much, Yuval. So guys, as you see, we are extremely, extremely passionate about everything related to WASM and the extension of service mesh and Envoy specifically. Uh, we think that this is the future of the cloud. Uh, we worked very hard to create a tooling to make it extremely simple to use it. And we really hope that everybody will use it. Running as Envoy in production for a lot of big, huge enterprise, our customers, I can tell you that this is so valuable and extremely ex uh, desired. Um, look, everything that we're doing, most of the stuff that we're doing is open source, including Glue and, uh, and, and a Service Mesh. All the work that we're doing is all, all, almost open source. Um, come, you know, follow us on Twitter, uh, go visit our uh, repository, and specifically the Wasm repository. There you will find everything that Solo is doing, including a spec for Wasm OCI image. So please check it out. And we would love to take you, uh, you know, to get any feedback. Thanks so much.